Let me share with you a real story. A story that occurs in my pulmonary office way too often. More often than I would like to admit. This is the story of Kim, a middle school teacher who has never touched a cigarette in her life. She had a cold. After the cold, a dry cough. The dry cough doesn't get any better. One week goes by, two weeks, no improvement. She picks up the phone and calls her primary care physician. And she tells them, I've been coughing, it's not getting any better. Can I please come in to be seen? Well, our next available is three months from now. <laughs> she goes ahead and asks for something sooner. Sorry, nothing is available. She's thinking about it and says, okay, well, maybe I'll just go to the urgent center. Down the street, I'll go in, and they'll be able to help me. So she proceeds. $175 later, within the hour, she's in, she gets an inhaler, and she walks right back out. Two weeks go by. The inhalers didn't do anything. Maybe it is not a post-viral cough. What is going on? Now, four weeks after, she's hacking, she's coughing, her chest is tight, she doesn't feel any better, she picks up the phone and calls the primary care again. She explains all her symptoms. I can't breathe, I'm producing mucus, I really need to get seen. Okay, six to eight weeks. I might be able to get you in in six weeks with the assistant. But I can't breathe, I don't feel well, she tells them. I'm sorry, I can put you on a cancellation list. If something is available, we'll call you in. Again, she's like, all right, I'll try the next urgent care. Maybe I'll have a better luck. So she proceeds, and $200 later, within the hour, they actually do something. They do a chest x-ray, they give her an antibiotic, prednisone, steroid taper. She walks out, maybe I'll feel better. And effectively, 48 hours later, much better. She can breathe, the coffee's almost all gone, barely a tickle. She's like, oh my goodness, thank God I'm on the mend. It was probably just a bronchitis. She dies into the holiday season and lives her life. But let's take a step back, okay? Let's think about what is it to cough? What happens inside? The lungs, if you can imagine, are an upside down tree. Main windpipe coming down, going to the right and to the left, and it divides like roots and tree branches all the way through. Every single branch is actually hollow, and the lining is muscle. So what happens when that muscle gets irritated and brush burned? It swells. The brain detects it as something inside the actual windpipe and tells you to cough. But here's the deal. What if it's not just a swollen muscle. What if there is something inside? Let me share with you a statistic. 40% of lung cancers can initially be misdiagnosed. 40%. Lung cancer is the number one killer in men and women against all other cancers combined worldwide. And the British Medical Journal published a study a few years back Amongst the cancers that are misdiagnosed, lung cancers that are misdiagnosed, 47% of them are misdiagnosed as respiratory infections. 35% of the misdiagnosed lung cancers are diagnosed as exacerbations of chronic conditions, COPD, emphysema, asthma. And here's another statistic. Out of all lung cancers diagnosed last year, 25% of them were in non-smokers. And actually, amongst those 25%, 60 to 80% last year were mainly middle-aged women. So, when we cough, yeah, it must be, it can be a post-viral cough, a tickle, a normal cough, as you ask one another sometimes when you hear the other person cough all the time, but it can also mean something else. And having the same problem 
as Kim did over and over again, might have been a red flag. So, when you go to the urgent care to evaluate something that occurs over and over again, do you think that that's the right choice? But let me ask you a question. How many of you, of all of us, have gone to urgent care for convenience sake, right? Let's take this analogy, a fast food analogy. Imagine, nowadays, going to a primary care physician, it's like going to a family restaurant. You call, you make reservation, you go in, you sit down, you have a discussion, you evaluate any problems you might have, you exchange ideas, but that's because you might have the luxury of time, of convenience, and affordability. But what if you don't have the time to wait to resolve an issue? What if you don't have the money to be able to afford healthcare insurance or a visit? Well, what do you do when you're hungry and you can't go to a restaurant because it's too expensive? You go to the fast food, drive through. You drive right through, you place your order, you pick up your sandwich and you move on. No more hunger. Same thing in health. When you have an issue and you can't wait and you can't afford to have health care, what do you do? You go to the drive through of health care. Urgent care. You walk in, you don't wait six to eight hours like in an emergency room. Within the hour or two, you might pay a little money. They'll take credit cards. You walk in, they see you, they evaluate you. They give you the prescription. They might even give you a real diagnosis. You walk in, you walk out, and you're good to go. Oh, I'm not dying right now. I'm going to be good. I just saw a doctor. Did you? Let me share with you statistics. The landscape of urgent cares in the United States have radically changed. 2009, urgent cares were popping left and right at the end of every single street. Anybody that needs help goes right in. Most importantly, these institutions, the urgent care, employed 95.8% physicians. 2009. Fast forward to 2022. Amongst their staff, only 20% are physician. The remainders, nurse practitioners, physician assistant, etc. But here's the problem. Urgent care do exactly what they're supposed to do within their limitations. They were never meant to evaluate and manage chronic, complex conditions. They were literally built to help with acute, urgent, emergent situations. You cut yourself, you don't wait for eight, 10 hours, you go to the urgent care, they stitch you up, and you're on your merry way, right? Unfortunately, here's where we are. We are drifting toward a seductive lull of convenience. But the truth of the matter is, illnesses do not exist in a vacuum. They are shaped by genetics, history, lifestyle, environmental exposure. Health is fluid. It is dynamic. It is personal. Imagine yourself a thousand-piece puzzle. You walk in, and the primary care is perfectly trained and set up to evaluate you, put the corners exactly where they are, try to actually get the picture exactly the way it's supposed to be. But when you walk in urgent care, you're walking into a place where they're trained to put together 10, 15, maybe 30 pieces puzzle in a record time because they got to keep going. The pressure is real. Right? So, what happens when you expect that much of an urgent care is that a piece of that puzzle might be missing. It might be misplaced. 
and in medicine, in health, one piece can make the difference between life and death. So you ask me, well, where did all the doctors go? Why can't we see them? Why can't we find one? Why can't we get in in a timely manner? Let me add another statistic. Over the past decade, private equities have joined the party. Private equities have been acquiring hospitals and urgent cares and emergency rooms. As of last year, they own a third of the emergency rooms in the United States. And they have bought over 450 hospitals. Private entities, businesses. What matters is the bottom number, the bottom line. Practitioners now are stuck between trying to treat patients, evaluate them, but at the same time, they're struggling to make end meet. So, ultimately where we are is time has become luxury. And listening is a lost art. Let's go back to Kim. How many have you have guessed? What happened? Yes, the cough came back with a vengeance. And what did she do? She called again and again. And after the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth urgent care, multiple antibiotics, multiple steroid tapers, inhalers, cough medications, no improvement. And she has yet to get in with her primary care. So what does she do? She Googles her way into the doorsteps of a direct primary care, DPC. Yes, they're out there. Direct primary care are available, affordable. Within 24 hours of making the phone call, she's sitting right in front of him. He listens, he hears her, he understands her, empathic, compassionate, and more importantly, he advocates for her and gets on that insurance company to pre-authorize that CAT scan. It took an hour and a half, and it's a true story, to finally get that pre-authorization. And thank goodness he did. That CAT scan demonstrated the tumor, which led her to the pulmonary office where I practice. From there, I took her to the emergency, to the operating room, and in there, we diagnosed her, and she was one of the lucky ones out of the over, over 175 that I diagnosed last year. She had a curable disease, she was resected, and she's doing well. So what should we do? As physicians, yes, we're speaking up, but we need more voices your voices, you have the power. You can find the physicians that hear you, see you, it can be there for you. Direct primary care is out there, you just have to find it. True, we're trying to build a world where healthcare is better. But I gotta tell you, for right now, no one is coming to save you. Take responsibility of your health. Find the care you deserve. Thank you.